Hey, what's up, everybody? Adam Pohl, Paul Cleary with you once again for another offseason chat. And we've got a former Bay Sox great who has always kind of stepped into the, the radio business. Josh Towers is with us. Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here this evening. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. Yeah, you know, Josh, I, I really was a big fan of yours. Uh, we are of a similar age. So when you reach the major leagues, uh, you know, with the Orioles, my beloved team, I was, you know, just finishing up college. And, you know, it's interesting because in, in that era, that was when Jamie Moyer pitched a little bit for the Orioles. And, and you were a pitcher that also had such a great feel for pitching. I, you know, mm -hmm. you, you see scouts and they drool over the throwers, you know, they, they yeah. drool over the, okay, who's at 97, but you were such a guy uh, that was able to progress through the minor leagues due to your ability to, to, to really pitch. And, and uh, it, it had to mean so much uh, to, to be at that level in the game. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it, you know, reaching your goals or accomplishing those dreams, and you don't realize when you're a kid how how hard uh, it is. You just know that you like the game and you want to play, and so you just keep playing until uh, until somebody says no. But uh, <laughs> you don't know anything about that, like about yourself at the time. You just, I, I, I knew I never really threw hard, but we weren't really overly labeled back then like it is today, and. Yeah. You know, I tell my son, I tell a lot of kids, we have some other close friends that we, that um, are family, you know, related that just got drafted this year. And we talk about this a lot. I was like, you know, I wouldn't even have been looked at if uh, if I if, if I played in today's game. I just didn't throw hard enough. And it is all based off of velocity to get noticed. And then at some point we try to teach every one of those kids how to pitch right. uh, the way that, that I knew how to pitch. And you know, by default, I had to learn how to pitch a little bit more because I didn't have that power plus stuff. So it's like uh, from the teaching aspect, because my son's in college and I have other player kids that I work with. The teaching aspect, I, my I understand all of it, but my brain gravitates to control. And <laughs> I have a theory that the earlier you learn control um, long term, the better you'll be. It, we take the step backwards from velocity, but then it comes back up where I feel like sometimes velocity, once I, I attack that angle first, that always comes down over the course of your career to learn control. Um, so sometimes in the teaching aspect, I take a, a different approach to it. And it's hard for some of these young kids to like buy into it because we all yeah. do. Um, but yeah, man, by default, you kind of learn how to pitch. And then again, when you're facing these guys, uh, these Trey Mancini's of the world, for instance, <laughs> know how to pitch man because like i know the game i watch on tv trey mancini sets these hitter of these pitchers up all the time and i think it's crazy impressive to watch you know josh with that being said though for you when you're not a guy that lights up the radar gun you got to yeah. prove it at every level you know if, if you have great numbers in you know single a frederick at that time yeah. or or double a buoy everyone's like okay well let's see what he can do in triple a right so so for you when you made it to the major leagues in 2001 and established yourself on the back end of that orioles rotation it, it had to be so reassuring when you realized including going into your toronto days that that your stuff played at the highest level of the game i always knew that it would but i had a lot of people always tell me no i mean i had mm -hmm along the way telling me I'll never get to like double A for instance and I remember our pitch our coordinator at the time was Sid Thrift and yeah I think I said something when I made it to the big leagues that Sid said uh Josh was never supposed to make it but he didn't listen to anybody and I thought, <laughs> yeah I thought that was kind of a cool com a compliment because again like I, I, I say to my son all the time like we didn't I didn't know any better like we just played baseball and right. I always but if I did well enough I could make it I didn't know that like honestly I really wasn't supposed to um and it's it, it, it is it's it's rewarding but arrogantly in your head you always believe that you were going to get there and I remember like I, I messed up probably getting the call up in 2000 mm -hmm. uh, I got hurt in 2000 triple I, I I uh separated my shoulder falling off a trampoline one night and uh luckily for uh you know Jay Spurgeon uh, earned the call up at the time which is kind of cool but um so I, I kind of missed that but when I did get the call up and I felt like I did well in the minor leagues. Mm -hmm. I remember arrogantly 
telling my pitching coach, even though I was crazy excited. Um, I think I arrogantly said it's about time or something like that, you know, <laughs> like it could have been any more disrespectful. Like it's not, it's earned and it's never, it's never something that like you're supposed to have. Like it's something that you, you earn. No one's getting, it's not guaranteed because you play baseball that you're going to get that call up. And, um, but you know, in your head, you kind of feel like, at times it is. And so it, it was, uh, it's, it's hard to put into words what it really, really meant and what it's, what like the appreciation aspect of working your whole life and having these dreams. And then it, it really did happen. Like you're really going to, to Baltimore, to Camden Yards. Like it's, it's not, are we sure? <laughs> it was cool. So what was it like then the, the first day that you step on the field at Camden Yards? What's, what can you remember about that day that emotion, the, 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 this spectrum of the, the stands and everything? You know, there's a lot of moments that blur together. Um, the actual very first day putting on a uniform in, with the Baltimore Orioles and going to the bullpen, I don't remember because I didn't pitch that day that I recall. But I remember the very first day I pitched. I remember the situation. I remember running from the bullpen. I remember after the inning was over in between innings, what Kyle Ripken did, like you remember some very specific things, um, but like the blurriness of like showing up to the field and getting your uniform and making sure you're on stretch on time, but crazy nervous and who you're going to play catch with, like all that stuff kind of like, I don't, I don't specifically remember. So you don't remember who you played catch with. You don't know who your first guy is and you yeah. were like, we're going to be no, friends forever. I those are like the cool things to me too I don't but um the MLB debut coming out of the bullpen like I remember that I mean I remember running out of out of the pen in, in left center and uh Ben Grieve was on second base Vinny Castilla is the batter and I remember like running past Ben Grieve as he's standing on second base and it it looked like he was 10 feet tall like <laughs> it looked a video game it wasn't real like I'm like running by and I, I felt like I was looking straight up like, oh my God, that's Ben Grieve. And, you know, like <laughs> in the beginning, you, you know, you see the names on the back of the jerseys more than uh, the holes in their swing and, and the uniform. And, but yeah, Ben looked enormous and, and, and Vinny Castillo was up. And I remember very first pitch uh, learning back now, lesson learned, you know, Vinny Castillo, like that's this kid making his major league debut and, um, he jumped ship. He swung at the first pitch and he was trying to set me up, which he did a pretty good job. He got a pitch to drive, but luckily for me, I, I hit my lanes well and, and Vinny popped it up and found territory on the first pitch for the third out. And, um, you know, thinking back to it, like he knew I was going to throw a strike. Like that's all my whole, whole, he did like, you know, you got to do making his debut. He's not worried about really locating it. He's just worried about not throwing a ball or walking somebody. So, right. you know, better in, uh, veteran move by Vinny, but I got away with it. But uh, I remember after, because there was two outs after the inning was over, I went, you know, got my drink, sat down and Cal Ripken Jr. came, sat next to me, put his hand on my leg for a second and then put his hand on my chest. And of course my shirt's moving. Um, you know, my heart's going so fast. And <laughs> he looks at me and he goes, nah, I think you're going to be okay. And he walked away. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. You love the you Josh know, confidence, man. I, I mean, you, yeah. you, you show it, and I think that uh, you talk about about uh, teaching young pitchers, right? And you can teach them mechanics. You can work on control. You can now, I mean, to be honest, something that's different in today's era, which is, you know, you, you can do all these things to try to develop velocity, you know, with weighted ball routines and, and all of the, like, things of that nature. But more importantly, if you don't believe in yourself, it can be a really lonely place on that hill in front of all those people. Yeah, all that stuff to like increase velocity at the end of the day doesn't really do anything. I mean, I, I can get stronger. Mm -hmm. I can work on specific things. I can maintain strength and speed internal. There's things that I can do to help unleash um, what I have, but you either have it or you don't. Um, and then how you get it to come out and how you get it to maintain is important. So all of that stuff is becomes dangerous at times because, you know, used wrong or the wrong timing can, can, can be detrimental. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky on the whole, the whole velo thing, but um, 
you know, we, we, you, you do your best and try to, you know, try to, again, you don't want to like get hurt too much. You don't want to like try to do too much stuff. And so you try to teach the pitching aspect first as you're maintaining the strength and learn. There's so many little things. I was talking with a kid named Joey Estes today who pitches for the Braves. He was in low A last year, had a phenomenal mm-hmm. year. And I worked with him last offseason with my son and the rest of the kids that we have that are either in pro ball or in college. Um, and, and, and I was kind of getting on him today a little bit, like, yo, we got to get this throwing thing started. And, and he's like, well, I kind of did start. I'm, I'm about, you know, two to three weeks in. And I was like, bro, there's no about, what do you mean? I'm about like, this isn't, this is, this is case specific. Everything we do is very important. Like there's a start time. We have a, a program that we're following very specifically because you had a good year last year. doesn't mean that we rest now doesn't mean that when we were specific last year, now we can kind of chill. Sometimes we'll, we'll go, or maybe at two or maybe a nine or because there's not, it's not like that. I was like, this is the next level for you of development. You, you had a, a, you went to spring training, you had a really good spring. You came in ready. Your season was top 10 in all of baseball, minor league baseball for what you did. I was like, this is where people kind of rest on their success, but this is the next level of the mental side of, yeah, you're developing leg strength or core strength or cardio strength or rotator cup strength, or you're developing something, uh, working on a development of my slider, let's say, but the, the, the advanced levels of what we do is understanding this aspect and the sacrifices that we have to make and, and, and the, the selfishness of what we really do and, I go, if I call you and say, hey, let's go out to, to dinner, or let's go get a drink or let's do something, you got to be willing to tell me no, because you have something that's very specific that you're trying to accomplish that that somebody like me who works a nine to five doesn't have. Right. And so like, you got to be willing to tell me no, because my I'm just waking up and going to work and you, your, your, your very specific trained plan is is future endeavors down the road. And, and we don't in the regular world know this. I was like, so we went pretty advanced today on the mental side of, of the sacrifices that we have to make on top of, again, our throwing program and everything else that we're specific with. I was like, there's, there's so much more that goes into this that I didn't know when I was in Bowie. I didn't know at that level you learn along the way and hope. And, and I always tell these kids, I tell um, all of them, I was like, I can, we can write a book on all the reasons why people do not make it to the major leagues. And there's a million reasons. Mm-hmm. And this is, of it i always talk about like you see football players and baseball players athletes alike we have uh really good seasons and the next thing you know i'm, I'm getting called to do all these commercials and i'll see patrick mahomes on every commercial or andrew yeah. was on every commercial. And every time you see somebody that was not doing any of this year before next thing you know they're on every commercial it took time to do those commercials it took sacrifices away from maybe my my gym routine or whatever the case may be and, and if you ever notice, they always have a setback. They always struggle. They're, they're never as good as they were because we start to rest a little bit on success. And that's where my respect for the Cal Ripkins and the Derek Jeters and, 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 and these people like the Tom Brady's, that's why I have so much respect for them because they maintain that, 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 that the sacrifices that you have to, to, to make to get there. How do I, how do I stay here? How do I improve when I'm at the very top? And these guys were very good. I always said, why did Derek Jeter take ground balls the very last day he was in the big leagues before the game? Don't you think he's filled it enough ground balls? I'm pretty sure he was okay. But that tells you the professionalism of who he is. And, and those are the next level sacrifices that we, we have to make as athletes that we don't always understand or know. It's, it's, there, there's, there's so much that goes into this, man. That, that sounds like the Apollo Creed syndrome right there. Yeah. Just before he's going to fight the Russian. Mm-hmm. He just goofs off. He's yeah, playing well, around. Yeah. And 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 his son learned uh through his lesson, Buckley with Rocky. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's right. <laughs> so you are a uh a movie buff guy, right? You enjoy movies. If I I did some reading up on you and I found that uh in one of your articles, you said one of the, your the best things you've ever got, this is back early in your career, mm-hmm. was a DVD player because all you like to do was watch movies. Yeah, that about right. It, it's changed obviously since. Um, I do I do like movies, don't get me wrong. The movie theater is a fun place. Before every start for years, uh Scott Schoenweiss um got me onto it because he used to do it. But before every start, I would go uh, to the movie theater and watch a movie if I could. And and in most cities, like you don't have a problem. And uh I would do that because like you're so geeked up and you're so nervous but excited that 
it was like my way of of catching up on something I hadn't seen. I have a couple hours that day extra, but it also relaxed every aspect of you to kind of get your mind away from what you're about to do because um, sometimes you can get overly geeked up. But in the minor leagues, it was different. It's not like today's world. In the minor leagues, we didn't have our phones to do all this stuff. We didn't have phones in general, really. So um, <laughs> we, 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 we carried our, our DVD players on the, on the bus rides, and I would have those – those binder books of every DVD. And if you guys remember on Tuesdays, that's when the movies came out at Best yeah. Buy. Yeah. Every day, man, we're there. <laughs> Whatever movie that we needed. And uh, and that's how we got through most of our bus, bus rides. So we were addicted to it at the time. So uh, sticking with the movie idea. Uh, now, at the end of this, I'm going to do this rapid fire yeah. thing at you. But this is kind of one I throw out there. Would you say the minor league life and major league life? Is it more like Bull Durham? more like major league or more like eastbound and down <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you threw that one in there well yeah um, i seen you went to the mexican league so you would have been in that with steven so i'm just <laughs> <laughs> but just so we're clear my <laughs> is in the mexican league we're 100 percent eastbound and down really like, as much of a joke as that that show was uh i saw that really happen a few times and it was it was nuts man that was the craziest <laughs> experience i've ever had um the fact of the matter is bull durham is 100 percent the most accurate baseball movie of all time especially when it comes to the minor leagues i mean they they nailed it with that movie that's reality the honestly like setting the sprinklers up to water to fill it down because you want a day off like all that's real man like that movie was awesome uh, <laughs> that's great. yeah you also got to play uh, in what many people think is the most fun town in the major leagues, right? Toronto on it. I, I, is that the truth? Great place. Yeah. I didn't notice like when you're, when you're visiting with the Orioles, you didn't really know, you know, you just, you saw this cool city and the shopping and whatever, but you just went to the field and did work and people talked about it. But until you get there, you don't really get to appreciate all the little things that make a city special. Um, I'm sure it's changed since, since my time, but, I thought, I, I mean, the people were fantastic. The city, there's basically to my, in my brain, there's two parts to that downtown where you get to, you get to walk around and enjoy it. I thought the whole city was just really, really, really neat. And one of the things they had, they had this driving range in the middle of the city, kind of off the freeway. And you can go after the games and hit some balls and relax or whatever. They unfortunately got rid of that for high rises, but it was one of the things that made the city pretty cool. Is it like the top golf that they have in Vegas? Yeah, it was just a driving range like that. Yeah. We get oh, so, so it wasn't like computerized, all that fancy the stuff. Golf, just a legit range for, for golf, but it was like two tiered and you hit into the net, but you were really hitting into the city of the skyline. Yeah. And it, it, it is, I guess, at this point, it would be their version of what Top Golf would be. It was pretty cool, man. Uh, so while you're in Toronto, let's jump in to the A Rod day. Yep. The day you plucked them, which, by the way, being an O's fan, fantastic hit him again <laughs> that son of a hit him again what led up that what what sets you off just like you know what nope this this man deserves he earned it he he cashed the check time to time to get it going yeah uh i'll try to i'll try to make the story quick it's a long story uh <laughs> how it started we were in in toronto he was on first base there's two outs Posada was up if i'm not mistaken howie clark's playing third yeah. john McD shortstop two outs Alex takes off on the pitch and it's a pop fly to Howie Clark at third so he's camped as Alex ran behind Howie he yelled uh mine 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 so Howie immediately thinks Johnny Max calling him off for the ball which he would as a third baseman so Howie just peels out of the way and the ball falls down and Johnny Max nowhere near it because he's not going to call it off Howie's camped and at that moment we all like you heard him say it but you realize what really happened at that moment. And so a lot of people, they're like, okay, not that big of a deal, but that's one of those unwritten rules that you don't ever cross in our game. Like that's, that's just something you don't do. And so Howie, very respectful kid, didn't say too much, you know, maybe like, come on, Alex, you can't do that. Johnny Mag, John McDonald said something to Alex. Mm -hmm. Alex turns to him and, and says, who the blank are you? Like to kind of just belittling Johnny Mag, which is funny. <laughs> because there's only 30 major league shortstops in the world. Oh, I mean, 
Big Mac is, you know, and and how, and, and A Rod knew he he knew he messed up. He knew he never should have did that again. That's a line you don't ever cross. Stuff like mm-hmm. that. You want to signs a second, whatever. Good. You don't do stuff like that. Um, and like a lot of us were pissed off. I remember Matt Stairs was pissed off. I was pissed off. There's a lot of pissed off people. Um, again, I just I can't emphasize like as a player on the field like. Like, I couldn't imagine doing that. Like, it's just so crazy to me. So we're going to – we're we're obviously going to hit Alex. <laughs> My buddy Brian Wolf is making his major league debut. Alex is next at bat. And uh, as he tells me, he was told not to hit him. I said, you're being a sissy first off. But, uh, again, you're making your major league debut and the first guy you face, like, that's the situation. <laughs> so, so Brian, Brian – some coach, some coach told him not to do it. Um, so he didn't hit them. So the very next time we're facing them, we're in New York and, and everybody knows on my team that I'm going to drill Alex right away. And so I'm in the bullpen getting loose. And I hear the phone ring and I was like, why is the phone ringing the bullpen right now? And, and somebody answers it and they're, Hey, and I'm warming up, right. Get ready for the game. And, uh, I get to, Hey, Josh, come over here. It's, it's John Gibbons, our manager. Get over here. He's he wants to talk to you. I'm like, dude, I'm warming up. And they're like, yo, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And I'm very routine oriented. Like I'm messing with my stuff. And I'm like, what's up, bro? And he goes, Hey, you can't hit Alex. Major League Baseball just came in, said, if you hit him, you're suspended. I'm suspended. Vice versa. We get penalized, all this stuff. Uh, and I was like, I don't care. I'm still going to hit him. And he's like, Josh, I'm telling you, you can't hit him. And I was like, I was like, Gibby, like, I can't just let this go. And this is not the first time the Major League Baseball stepped in. And every time they step in, it prolongs it, it makes it worse. They did this with Tampa as well. If, if we just handle our business, it's over already. But every time they step in, it lingers because internally, like, as a player, you're not really going to let it go. Um, and Major League Baseball doesn't understand that aspect. They think they're kind of nipping in the butt, but they don't. They just make it worse. So I'm coming through the field after I get done right before the game starts. I'm walking to the, the dugout, and Matt Starris can sense that I'm kind of pissed off. And he's like, what's wrong, man? And I was like, I just got a call, and I can't hit him. Gibby said this, and he goes – and don't get me wrong, Matt was uh, angry, very upset about this whole situation. So for Matt to say this was kind of weird, but he's like, don't. And I was like, what do you mean don't, Matt? Come on, dude. And he goes, dude, they're back to our place in three weeks. Uh, just don't hit them. Everybody will forget about it. And then, you know, if you feel like you want to hit them, then hit them then. But let it die down and everybody forgets about it. And I was like, dude, that's why I love you so much. You're so you're always ahead. You're, like, you're always three steps ahead. <laughs> So luckily, uh, a few weeks later, when they came to Toronto, I was actually pitching game one because it just worked out that way. Um, and so I was going to wait to hit him. And then I, I gave up a couple of hits or something. I was pissed off on the mound. And he comes up and now I'm going to drill him. I didn't tell my catcher anything, but now I'm going to hit him. And all I could think about was like, where do I want to hit him? Like, you're never going to throw at somebody's head. Like, you just don't do that no matter how mad you are. You just don't, you don't do that. Uh, if I hit him in his butt or his back area, like that's not going to do anything. I don't throw hard. That's, you know, padded area. So I'm like, I, I, like, you know, you want to send a message and you want it felt, but like you can't cross lines either. So I'm on the mound, like, where do I want to hit him? And as I'm sitting there, like, like looking in, you know, I like, I just see his knee. And I was like, man, if I hit his knee, that's bad. That's ball on bone. Like he's going to feel this. And, and I knew I had good control. So I decided I was going to try to smoke him in his knee. And luckily for me, I threw a sinker and hit him perfectly in his knee. And, uh, <laughs> the rest is history. We fought quite a few times after that. You know what, Josh, before we jump into Paul's questions, I do want to make a note that that story all started with Howie Clark, a former <laughs> Bowie Bay Sock. How about that? <laughs> oh, my old teammate, roommate, everything for years. Actually, before I get into that, Adam, I got one more thing to talk about. We talked about his glory. He had like a, a, a shutout in Camden Yards. Um, there was a point where he's in, back in the minors again, and he's playing, uh, it's July 26, 2008. He's playing for the Sky Sox, which I believe was, was the Rockies, right? Yeah. Uh, he's facing a guy, second inning, facing a guy named Ryan Roberts from the Red Hawks. Mm-hmm. And Ryan gets off of him in one inning, seven RBIs and two home runs. At what, what is going through your head? Like, 
<laughs> coach, just take me out. Damn, I don't want to see no more. And then it goes another one. And were you like, you know, I'm just going to hit him. I'm just going to hit him next time I see him. <laughs> you're going to you're going to trip out on the story. I've never told the story. Um, and I don't really lie either. So, you know, for people who think I might be embellishing a little bit, um, it, I don't even like I don't mind telling it, but I, I honestly feel like I don't want any like player listening to this to think that this is something you should ever do because uh, I, I, I don't condone this at all. Um, the Rockies and I had a bad relationship from the get go, unfortunately, and it sucked. Um, but my my team was like, I love my teammates and, we you know, everything was fun the, the season, but um, they trapped me down there. And for whatever reason, they just you know, they, they held things against me and my manager was a good dude. Um, but he was a company man too. So I don't know what conversations they had throughout the course of the season about me, but, um, I, I thought for a while I was doing good as a starter. Then they put me in the pen and hid me there and they, they were doing anything that they could to, to not call me to the big leagues, which at that point, whatever, I'm on a major contract. It's messed up. But uh, again, they had their reasons. Um, and next thing you know, I'm like, I think I'm starting again. I think I started this game. Ryan was, by the way, my teammate with Toronto. We were buddies. Yeah, I did uh, yeah. see that later. Yeah, that, that he, yeah. you guys were together eventually. Ryan and our friends. Uh, I'm getting rocked in this game. Um, it, it starts to go south, and I'm starting to get tattooed a little bit. And, like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very good team player. Like, I understand a lot of things. And there's times where a starter gets rocked, and your bullpen has to pick it up, and, and, and you don't have innings and your starter has to go as much as they can. Some right. days it is what it is. And I understand all of that. We weren't in that situation and I started to get rocked and he's just leaving me out there to die. And he's not even flinching. They never come to the mound to have a mound visit, nothing. Um, and it's to a point where I'm trying everything in my power to be successful and get out. And my catcher and I are working on different things and I just didn't have it. And I'm getting throttled. And there's a number that you don't let your pitchers really get past. Like every now and again, you see somebody give up like 10 runs in an inning. No pitcher should ever be put in that situation. Um, I don't care what the situation is. Like you just don't, you know how long it is for pitchers to come back from giving up 10 runs in an inning, especially a reliever, by the way. Right. Uh, so certain things you just don't do, but sometimes you have to let guys eat it. We weren't in a position where I needed to wear it, but for whatever reason, he was holding it against me. Um, and I would look in the dugout, like, are you guys going to come out and even like talk to me? Are you going to come out here and give me a break? Like nothing. And, and they didn't, they would just sit in the dugout kind of kicking it. And I started to get pissed off. Like you're real. I looked down at the bullpen. There's nobody getting loose. And I'm like, damn, you guys are really going to let me wear this. I mean, I think that if there was an opportunity for me to give up 15, they probably would have allowed it. Um, and so I'm getting like, at this point on the mound, I'm getting kind of pissed off. And I feel like it's very disrespectful of my manager um, and the Rockies organization at that point. I was not happy. And so I start to calculate what's going on. And I start to look at like, all right, he already hit a home run off me. Ryan did. And he earned it. He earned every bit of that home run. I didn't do anything like he got me. Um, and they're tattooing me. So then I'm starting to look down the lineup a little bit. And I'm like, all right, well, you want to play that game? And it, 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 I don't know how, like, in my head, like, I thought that, like, it was going to piss them off. It's all my stats. Um, and it is kind of disrespectful to my teammates. This is why I don't condone this stuff. But I started to look down the lineup, and I'm like, all right, well, Ryan's coming up again in this situation. How cool would that be for him to hit two home runs in an inning and one of them's a grand slam? I think he already hit a grand slam, actually. It might have been two grand slams, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember the first home run, but it was a lot of stakes. And – <laughs> so I was like, all right, you want to play that game? And I'm looking and there's no budging. I'm looking, there's no budging. So I'm like, all right, I need these two guys to get on base. And then Ryan's going to come up and I'm going to serve one up and I'm going to let him hit a grand slam. So I think I, uh, I think the first two got on, luckily. I don't know sure how the guy before got on. I don't know if I, I intentionally put him on. I don't know if I drilled him or if I walked him, but I made sure he got on base because I wanted Ryan to come up with the bases loaded and have an opportunity to hit another grand slam. Um, and I did. I put both those guys on, and I look, and he's not flinching. And I remember stepping off the mound, and I didn't say it out loud, but to myself, I was like, bro, you better not miss this pitch. Like, <laughs> you, like, oh, like 
I wanted to say that so like you better not miss this damn pitch. Like I'm about to groove on like I've never groove on. <laughs> and if you pop up or hit a single, like if, I'm gonna be so pissed. Um, and he got he got on the he got up there to bat, and you know it's just one of those like like tip your cap type things, you know, like where you only want him to see it and nobody else. And uh, I don't know if he if he got the message or not, but. I took as much off of it, but I still wanted the finish, the, the pitch to finish because I didn't want him so far in front. And I just grew to force him right down the middle. And luckily, he hit a jack and uh, hit a grand slam. And at that point, there was nothing they can do. They're like, all right, like you can tell that, like <laughs> you can tell my body language wasn't there. And so he had to pull me after that. But like I was like, all right, you guys want to keep screwing around? I don't know how this makes you look, but watch this. And so uh, I never told Ryan either. Um, the story because I didn't want to make him feel like oh you gave me a home run <laughs> yeah. I was so pissed at that organization I was so pissed at my manager at that point that um that I made sure he came up with the bases loaded and group one and again I'm so happy that he didn't miss it because I would have been pissed if he missed it <laughs> all right let's move on to our rapid rapid things here that I throw out so generally I'm going to give you uh two things you don't have to explain you just have to give me your answer. How quick? And uh, you Real know, quick. <laughs> don't don't go to the bathroom and come back with an answer. <laughs> Great. All right. So number one, since in high school you really weren't looking to be a pitcher, you were looking to be a shortstop, third baseman, right? I just wanted to play. Just God bless you. God bless you. That's the, that's what we like to hear about baseball players. Um, the DH rule, good or bad? I don't like change. I mean, I do like change in life. I think there's a lot of things like you know. You, you have to be, you have to accept change. It's, it's very vital to success and growth. Um, but when it comes to stats, when it comes to the hall of fame, when it comes to comparison, you can, like I always say, you can never compare generational stats. It doesn't work that way. Um, the DH has been a, a, a very important part of our game in the American league and not in the national league. Um, like interleague play, I don't like it because I think that, the American League Baseball is played this way. National League Baseball is played this way. And for two reasons, again, one, the best team in the National League based on how they play baseball gets to the World Series. The best team in the American League based on how they play baseball gets to the World Series. And now we have a best of seven series against each other. Your style versus our style. We've never seen you all year. Right. May the best team, best whatever win. I think that that's, there's a purity in that that I just love about our game. So getting rid of it or making the whole thing uh, DH, I don't, I don't, I don't like. I, I, I love what the World Series stood for. And then again, stats wise, um, like you can't come up and say so and so doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame or so and so does. And I'm comparing him to players of the past, and and we've made so many different changes to the rules that you can't. Like everything is different. They're the people who are Hall of Famers in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. They like they couldn't play in today's game, or they could play in today's game, and we couldn't play in their game. Um, right? Like there's just too much change, and so if we're going to continue to base our voting off of whatever the case may be, stop changing rules so that there at least is some sort of you know connection that that makes it legit. But I, I just again when we're voting for the hall of fame, base it off of this era and not yesterday's era, a combination of eras, because it's just not fair to the players in the game of baseball. So change too much and adding or taking away the, the DH. I'm not for it for those reasons. All right. So you're saying, keep it, keep it as is. And keep it. Paul, we got time for two, two more quick questions. Okay. Got them going. Buzz Lightyear or Woody? Oh God. <laughs> Don't ask why, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go Buzz. There you go. Nothing wrong with that. He, <laughs> Buzz had the attitude and confidence. That's what we like about him. Uh, last one. Uh, based on high school baseball. Yes. Vikings or Raiders? I was a Viking. My name is Viking, so we're going Vikings. Who, who was your rival? In high school? Yep. I don't really think we had one. I mean, Oxnard – would have been the rival, but they weren't in our league, uh, ironically. So uh, I really didn't have – in junior college, I had a rival. But in high school, 
Uh, I think the rival was ourselves. I mean, I lived in such a crazy era <laughs> in, the, in the mid nineties in Southern California where it was so gang related um, that sometimes we couldn't even, we didn't have enough players to, to fill the team. Uh, I remember fielding, playing a game one time with only eight players because this is going to sound crazy, but it's like, where's our teammates? And I'm like, coach, there's a, uh, there's a gang initiation jump in. So we lost. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? So uh, we, we were our own worst enemy. <laughs> well, jo Hey Josh, we are out of time. I just want to say thank you so much. It's been awesome having you with us today. Thanks, awesome. Josh. I appreciate it, Thanks buddy. Thanks for taking us down memory lane, brother. All right, bro. Thank you.